church, you may be seated as our worship team presents this song.
28 says, in the end, in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel of the Lord answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you. Church, would you stand with us and let's worship our risen Savior this morning. Oh, praise the name of the with us today we want to thank you and if you brought a guest we want to thank you as well and we've got a gift that we'd like to give to both of you so we want you to go by as you leave today out these back doors of the auditorium just to your right there's a table and on that table there's a book it's called a quest for friendship it's a brand new book I guarantee nobody has it yet it just came out a good friend of mine wrote this and uh, I want to give this to everyone that is a guest today and that brought a guest today so please go by and uh, make sure you grab a copy of this book. My wife's got an announcement too for all the families. We just want to make you aware we have, we want you to take advantage of our picture wall, our Easter photo wall um, that you'll see on your way down to the nurseries, but it's for everyone. So moms, as you're walking down your nursery, you see it here on your left hand side, but families, we want everyone, couples, everyone to take advantage of our Easter picture wall. There's just a lot of things going on here in our church, and we know that uh, you may be relatively new to our church. It may be your first time. You may have been here uh, all of your life. Uh, 
but there's a lot of things that are going on and hopefully on the way in you grabbed one of these bulletins and on the back of it is a lot of information that we want to make sure that you know of things and events that are coming up. There's also attached to the end of it a connect card and we would love to have you fill that connect card out uh, whether you've been here all of your life or this is your first time. Just fill that connect card out and drop it in the offering bucket uh, around the building and in the, in the hallways and it just lets us know that you are here and allows us to stay connected with you. And the other thing is that if you are a guest this morning, we have a gift for you. And in here, there's a special Easter gift uh, just for you. So we want to make sure that you get that along with the book uh, at our guest counter out there. And so if you just stop by there, we'll make sure that we get you one of those today. As we come, continue on worship, we come to our Lord in prayer this morning. What a beautiful day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. And as the song said, that he is risen, right? Amen. He's risen as he said. We just read in Matthew chapter 28. And if you continue reading in verse 9, the Bible says as the women were going to tell his disciples, Jesus actually met them. And Jesus just said one word. He said rejoice. Rejoice. And the Bible says they fell down at his feet and began to worship him. We're here to worship the king. We're here to worship the risen savior. We are here to worship our Lord. The Bible says he's now seated at the right hand of God the Father. And all power, all dominion, all authority has been given unto him. Father Lord, we thank you this morning. Father, we thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. Your word said you so, you so loved the world that you gave your only begotten son. That he will die for our sins. What a privilege for us to be adopted into your family. Father Lord, we say thank you. And as we come on this resurrection morning, to worship our King, to worship our Lord, to worship our Savior, to rejoice because He said we should rejoice. That may our hearts be prepared to worship You. May our souls be prepared to honor You. That in everything we do this morning, Lord, the glory and the honor will be unto Your Majesty. And all God's people say, Amen.
for that gift that Jesus Christ paid for us on that cross. Would you say amen? amen. Colossians chapter 1 says, Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet, to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us in the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created, that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist.
Praise the Lord. I am so glad that you are here to worship with us today. Worship a risen Savior, and we're so thankful for that. I hope on your way in today that you grabbed one of these communion uh, cups, and we, um, we normally don't do communion this way, but this past year has changed a lot of things uh, here at church, and we're hoping to get back to, to normal, how we would normally serve communion, but it's been a little while. And I just thought, what a wonderful day to do that when uh, families are gathered together and uh, our church family is here on this special day as we celebrate Resurrection Sunday. So I want you to turn with me, if you would please, to 1 Corinthians, the book of 1 Corinthians. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians 11 and in chapter 15 for our message today. But chapter number 11, Paul is writing to the church at Corinth about communion, about the Lord's table time to come together where we remember the body and the, the, uh, the body that was bruised and broken, the blood that was shed, so that we could have forgiveness of our sin. I know this past Friday, we would celebrate what we call Good Friday. It was a day that Jesus Christ went to the cross and he shed his blood on the cross. And could you imagine some 2,000 years ago how his disciples must have felt on that day where they have put everything into this man? the swan that claimed to be the Messiah. He, he shared with them, he told them that, that uh, he would be put to death, that he would be crucified, and, and they didn't quite understand what he meant. When he was placed there on that cross, they, they scattered. They were afraid. I was even thinking last evening as I was just contemplating on resurrection morning, what were the disciples thinking last evening? As... They weren't sure what was going to happen on that first day of the week. They weren't sure that Jesus Christ was going to raise again, rise again from the dead. They were afraid. They were gathered together. And there must have been this despair, this fear, this sense of hopelessness, not, not sure what's going to happen. Everything that he said, is it true? Is he really the Son of God? Is he really the one who he said that he was? All of those thoughts going through their mind, they had just seen him crucified. They've seen the Son of God be brutally beaten. They took and pulled his beard out. They took and put that crown of thorns and shoved that upon his head. And as his back was beaten and bloodied and his head was bloodied from that crown of thorns, they mocked him. They said, if you, you be the Son of God, come down off that cross. And, and Jesus didn't speak a word. They heard that earthquake and the sky darkened. The, the veil that was in the temple was rent into it from, from the, the top down. What a wonderful day that was, but for the disciples, they were unsure. And Paul tells the church that as we gather together to remember what Jesus Christ did, we celebrate with enthusiasm today the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the power over death, the victory that we have through Jesus Christ. But Jesus did go to the cross. He shed his blood. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There had to be a payment for your sin debt. And you and I were sinners. And there's nothing that we could do in ourselves to merit God's favor. There had to be a sacrifice. God left heaven's home and came to this earth, became man and lived a sinless life and went to the cross and his body was beaten, was bruised, was broken. His blood was shed. And on that cross, Jesus cried, it is finished. There's nothing else that's needed for forgiveness of sin. Jesus Christ paid our sin debt. And it doesn't matter how good of a person you are, how religious you are. There's nothing you can do to merit God's favor. Jesus Christ accomplished it all there upon the cross. I want you to read along with me, if you would, please, in 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. Paul writes this letter concerning the Lord's Supper in verse number 23. He says, For I have received the Lord, that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he, he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup. 
when he has supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as oft as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat that bread and drink that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak, and many are sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would be judged ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. If any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together unto the condemnation. And the rest will I set in order when I come. If you have your, your communion cup and, and wafer here that you grabbed this morning, I want you to take that and would you open that with me? We're going to take the, the cracker first. This represents the body of Christ. We don't believe that in any time this becomes the body of Christ. The body of Christ does not have to continue to be broken. It has already been broken once. He went to the cross once. He doesn't continue to go to the cross. He paid sin's debt one time for you and for me. We just simply come, and this is a reminder of the body that was broken the brutal beating that Jesus went through, the nail-pierced hands, that sacrifice that he made so that we could have everlasting life. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. Would you bow your head and pray with me for just a moment? Our Father in heaven, we do thank you and we praise you for the sacrifice Lord, we weren't there. We didn't experience, Lord, the, the fear and the, the uncertainty that maybe the disciples did at that time. We get to rejoice and read and know the, the conclusion of the story. But Lord, as we read, we find the body that you broke, that you was shed, the, that the blood that was shed, the body that was broken, the sin payment that we owed you took for us a perfect holy God took our sin and became sin so that we could be redeemed back to you Lord we thank you for that we praise you for it in Jesus name we pray and when he had given thanks he break it and said take eat this is my body which is broken for you this do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also we took the cup. If you'll take that cup with me, if you would, please. This cup is just grape juice. It doesn't turn into the body of, or the blood of Jesus Christ. It's just a symbol of the blood that was shed. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. The blood of Jesus Christ is powerful. There's not a sin that any of us have ever committed that the blood of Jesus Christ cannot pay for. There's nothing you've done too bad that you cannot be redeemed for. The blood of Jesus Christ is powerful. It was pure. It was holy. Jesus came to this earth. He lived a sinless life. He lived here upon this earth for 33 years. He was 100% man. Satan tried to tempt him to sin, and Jesus used the scripture. He lived a sinless life, and as he went to the cross, his blood was shed. It was a perfect sacrifice. When Christ shed that blood, that blood was payment for the the debt of sin that you and I owe. God accepted this blood. He accepted that sacrifice. Paul says this, after the same manner also, he took the cup. And when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and you drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he comes. 
Father, again, we thank you and we praise you. Lord, we lift our voices, our hands high to heaven. Lord, what an exciting day it is as we gather together as believers in Christ, realizing that what you did upon the cross. But Lord, it didn't end there. You're not in the grave. We don't serve a dead Savior. We serve a risen Messiah. Because of your resurrection, we have hope. Because of your resurrection, we have life. Because of your resurrection, we have power to become a child of God. And so, Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would just please bless the remainder of this service today. Bless our friends, our guests that are here. Lord, I pray that they've been encouraged as we celebrate the resurrection. And now, Lord, I pray that you'd speak to our hearts and challenge us as we open your word. And I ask you this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Just flip a few pages over with me again, if you would, please, to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. Paul is writing here at the same church, the church at Corinth. In his writing in verse number 12, where we're going to pick up reading here in verse 12 of chapter 15 of the book of 1 Corinthians. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there, there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain? And your faith is also vain? Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God. Because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised? And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. You are, not in your, you are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If any this life only we have hope in Christ... We are all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. I want you to take note to Paul as he writes in this first verse. He says, now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some of you, he asked this question, that there is no resurrection from the dead. There were some that were preaching that there is no resurrection. There were some that were preaching that they were, were, were telling and refuting this, this fact that Jesus Christ is actually risen from the dead. Jesus went into the tomb, and three days later, he came bursting forth. In Jesus Christ, I can stand before you today and tell you that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. And that's what we celebrate today as we celebrate Resurrection Sunday or Easter Sunday. We're celebrating a risen Savior. Paul introduces us to this question. He asked this question to the church at Corinth, and so obviously there were some there at this church that were, were disputing this. They were causing some issues. And so Paul, in his quest to get down to this, he asked this question, if he's not risen from the dead, uh, why, why, would, why would some of you say this? Because if he's not risen from the dead, we have some problems. And he goes through in these next several verses here in this chapter, he begins to point out the problems that there would be or the troubles that there would be if there was no resurrection. We come together today. I want you to see in verse number 14, Paul says this, and if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is vain. We come together today. Yes, we're singing of Jesus Christ. Yes, we're lifting our voices up and praising him for who he is. But we're coming today because we're going to preach that Jesus Christ is the resurrected Savior. And Paul says this, number one, if, if there is no resurrection, then preaching is pointless. We've wasted our time coming today. We might have got emotionally stirred while we were singing, but, but our singing was pointless. Each week that we gather and we gather to celebrate the resurrection, it's not just one time a year we look to the resurrection. The, the believer in Christ celebrates that every day of their life, rejoicing that our sins are forgiven, that our Savior is alive, that he's been resurrected from the grave. But if it's not true, Paul says this, our preaching is pointless. Look, look again, and if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain? We're wasting our time is what he's saying. 
We've come together in churches in Christianity for, for 2,000 years, have come together and, and are wasted their time if Jesus is still in the grave. What he's saying is this, there's no point for us to come. There's no point for us to gather today. Every, every liberal preacher who does not believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, they are preaching heresy. They ought to get an honest job. There are some that preach that. There, there are some in, in, in high in academics uh, uh, that, that are teaching uh, young preachers that are training for the ministry that the, the resurrection is, is not, uh, not as we believe it is. One said this, a liberal preacher said, his body lies in a nameless tomb, but his deathless spirit goes marching on. And I proclaim to you today that that is anti-Bible. That's not true scripture. The Bible doesn't tell us that his body is in the grave, some nameless grave but his spirit goes marching on. The Bible tells us this, on that third day, he rose again from the grave. That tomb was, that, that stone was rolled away from that tomb and his body is no longer in the tomb. There's not a nameless tomb someplace with the body of Jesus Christ. Our preaching is not in vain. Our preaching is not uh, 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 in uh, uh, pointless. That message that that preacher preaches is a sham. Jesus Christ is alive. And the preaching that he is not alive is fake. It's a fraud. And a preacher like that has no preaching preaching in any pulpit in America or any place in this world. That message goes against the gospel. Because the gospel message is the death. It is, as Friday we look to the cross, it is the death. Jesus Christ died. There were some that think this, that he didn't really die, that they thought he was dead. So he didn't really rise from the dead. He just never really died. No, the Bible tells us that he died. When he went to the cross, he shed his blood. When they put him in that tomb, the body of Jesus Christ was dead. They buried him in that tomb, and he resurrected from the grave. Our Jesus Christ, our Messiah, is alive. And as we come together today, we are not preaching some vain gospel. We are not preaching some fraud. We're not preaching something that is untrue. We are preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But Paul says if we believe that the resurrection is not true, we're preaching is pointless. He says this, look with me also in the same verse, and if, the, and if Christ be not risen, then is there preaching in vain? He also asks this question, and your faith is also vain? Not only is the preaching vain, but your faith is vain. Number two, would you write this down? If, if there was no resurrection, faith would be unnecessary and wasteful. Why put faith in a dead Messiah? Faith is no better than its object. We come together today because we have faith in Jesus Christ. The Bible says that it requires faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. There are so many critics today. They're always searching for proof. They're always wanting it to be what they can see and that they can understand. And I want you to know today that the preaching of the gospel requires faith. It's faith that Jesus Christ came and was 100% man and 100% God. It's faith that, that allows us to believe that Jesus Christ rose again from the dead. A dead man can't save anyone. Faith is required for salvation. Our faith in Jesus Christ would not be worth anything if Jesus was still in the grave. If we were worshiping a dead Savior today, there would be no faith. It would be wasteful. And how do you know, you may ask, he is the Son of God? The Bible says this, that his, he's shown to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. He is the Son of God. His resurrection proves that he is the Son of God. Buddha died, and guess what? He's still dead. Muhammad died, and he is still dead. 
There's a tomb that holds these bodies of these men, and they are still dead. Confucius died, and, and guess what? He is still dead. There is a tomb that, that holds his body. But Jesus Christ died, and he is alive. And there is no tomb that holds the body of Jesus Christ. There's no, there's no place, the, no nameless tomb, where we could find the DNA of the body of Jesus Christ. No, he is alive, just like he said. And the power of the resurrection proves he is the Son of God. You see, today, we're not putting our faith in a dead Savior. Today, as we lift our voices up, and I pray that you were encouraged as we sang about the, the blood of Jesus Christ and the resurrected body of Jesus Christ, we're not putting our faith in a dead Savior. We're not crossing our fingers today hoping that we got it right. Our faith is alive. Our faith is real because our faith is placed in a Savior that is not dead, that is not in a grave, but has risen again. In Romans 1, verse number 4, the Bible reads this, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. The resurrection proves the power of that causes, allows him to be the son of God. Verse number, uh, number three, I want you to write this down. Number three, see, if your friend invited you today, they told you I was a long-winded preacher, and I'm going to prove them wrong today. They told you, I know what they told you. Sit back, he's going to be a while. We're going to get out on time today. Have faith. <laughs> Verse 15, yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he raised not up if so be that the dead raise not for if the dead rise not then is not Christ raised I want you to write this down in verse number 15 if, if the resurrection is not true the disciples we are deceivers the disciples were deceivers. The Bible says we are found false witnesses in verse number 15. Paul is making a, a great statement here, a bold statement here. Paul is not saying if Jesus is still in the grave that we got it wrong. You see, he's not saying that, that we, we, we've been mistaken. We think that he's in the grave, but, but maybe we got it wrong. He's saying this, if he's not in the grave, we're deceiving you on purpose. We're making a choice to be deceitful. You see, it's one thing to get it wrong. It's another thing to be a false witness. A false witness knows that they're wrong, but continues a lie. A false witness will deceive you on purpose. A false witness is doing this for their own merit or their own gain. They're doing this for some weird pleasure that they may have in getting you to believe something they know is false. There's a difference, though, between being mistaken and a false witness. If Jesus is still in the grave, they're telling a lie. Because what they're saying is, we've seen him. The disciples are saying, we've touched him. We've spoken to him. We, we saw him pl be placed in that tomb, and we went to the tomb, and that third day, that morning, as we came to that garden, he was gone, the stone was rolled away, and there was an angel that said that he is risen, and they're telling a lie. But why would the disciples tell a lie? Why would they deceive? What gain would the disciples have? I want you to think about this this morning. What point would Paul have to be deceptive about the gospel? Paul, who is in, bound in prison. Paul, who has been stoned. Paul, who has been left for dead. Paul, who has been beaten, who has been placed in jail. Think about the disciples. What gain would Peter have of preaching a risen Messiah? When Peter himself was crucified upside down for preaching the gospel. These disciples had no gain of wealth. They had no gain of fame. They had no gain of fortune. The only thing these di disciples had was loss. 
So as they're preaching this gospel, as they're preaching a resurrected Savior, they're not preaching this as false witnesses. Many of the disciples have been martyred. Many of them persecuted. Disciples of Jesus Christ had been fed to wild animals. They've been killed by gladiators. They've been dipped in oil and burned on stakes for all the Romans to see. They've been, they've been uh, uh, placed in prisons and they've been brutally beaten and killed. What gain would they have to deceive? No, these disciples, they believed what they, pr- they were preaching. They were not false teachers. They, they saw the proof of the risen Savior. They saw him. They, they touched his hands that had the nails pierced his hands. They saw the, near, the nails pierced in his feet. They, they, they touched the side where that, that spear was placed into his side. They knew he was alive. They saw he was alive in the preaching of the gospel, the preaching of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ was not a deceitful thing. You see, hypocrites and martyrs are not made of the same stuff. Follow along with me if you would, please. A man may live for a lie, but few, if any, are willing to die for one. And these disciples were willing to die for the gospel message. They said, we've seen him. We've touched him. We've handled him. Paul, the author of this, as he writes this message here to the church, and he says this, How say some of you that there is no resurrection of the dead? As he asked this, and he says, We would just be false witnesses, or we would be lying. Paul died for this gospel. Would Paul die for a lie? Of course not. I want you to see, fourthly here, if there was no resurrection, look with me in verse number 17. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Sin would be supreme. Sin would rule. He said if there is no resurrection, there's no hope. Sin is one. All of us have sinned. But if Jesus Christ is still in the grave, we have no hope. There's no forgiveness. We're a sinner by birth. We're a sinner by choice. We're we're a sinner in our actions. And no hope apart from the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Sin would be supreme. Could you imagine living on this earth, living as a human being, knowing that there is no hope? How do we know that Jesus was not just some religious fanatic? How do we know that God accepted this sacrifice of Calvary? How do we know this? We know this because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Romans 4.25 tells us this, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. I like to remember that word as justification as this, just as if I had never sinned. If you're reading through and you see justification in the Bible, say, what does that mean? Just as if I had never sinned. Well, if sin is supreme, if sin rules, if there's no hope and there's no forgiveness of sin, then you can never be justified. Oh, you could try to be a good person, but guess what? You're going to fail. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. We have no hope. If the resurrection isn't true, if we preach that Jesus Christ really didn't rise again, that his spirit is alive but his body is dead, then sin is supreme and there is no hope. But the Bible says because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we are justified. Or we, it is if, if we have never sinned, when God sees you in Christ, he sees the precious blood of Jesus Christ in all the sin that you've ever committed. Sin is not supreme. Sin does not rule. The blood of Jesus Christ and the power of his resurrection justifies all man. No resurrection, no Savior. No Savior, no forgiveness. And none of us would have hope. None of us could achieve heaven 
if Christ is still in the grave. But oh, my friend, I proclaim to you today that because there is a resurrection, because Jesus Christ is not in the grave, that there is hope, that your sin has been paid for, that there's power in the resurrection, and you can have everlasting life because Jesus Christ defeated death and defeated sin, and he is the one that gives you life. Paul goes on to say this in verse number 18. Not only does he say, and if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain, you are yet in your sins, hopeless. In verse number 18, then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. What he's saying is this, death is supreme, and, or I'm sorry, sin is supreme. And then he says this in verse number 18, death is final. It's it. Life is nothing but a cruel joke. You live here on this earth, and this is it. This is the best that there is. Live and get what you can because there's nothing else. Death is final. No one would have anything to look forward to. If death was final and there was nothing after death, then this is the best it gets. The meaning of life would just simply be death. There's no more. I guess it's been 14 years now. I stood at a pulpit in a church in Michigan and I preached a message, a funeral sermon at the funeral of my, my father. And I remember coming through and just simply touching touching his hand as he laid there in that casket and I touched his hand and I said to my dad that, that day, I said, so long dad, I'll see you again. Why? Because death is not final. Several weeks ago I stood here at this pulpit and preached a message for a, a lady in our church, Beth Merrick. Her children were here, her grandchildren were here, her husband were here and we preached a message. We sang about the risen Savior. We preached a message about salvation. Oh, she lived the life, and she, had, she was very unhealthy and, and, and had a lot of uh, physical ailments. And, and the last several years of her life were, were, were miserable in pain. And that's not all there is. Could you imagine if that's all there was to life? Back in December, we preached a message again from this very pulpit. And in front of me laid a 21-year-old young lady, Olivia. Could you imagine if that was it? Her parents birthed her, brought her into this world, raised her, went through school, went through high school, 21 years, and that was the best they could get? death would be so final if there is no resurrection then this is all there is and death is cruel death does not have dominion though I preach to you today that Christ is risen those that have fallen asleep in Christ have not have not perished how great to know God in the form of man conquered death, and he conquered death. He arose from the grave, and because we celebrate the resurrection, because Jesus Christ is no longer in the grave, we don't have to fear death, and we don't have to fear life. So many that don't know Christ as their Savior, they're living a miserable life because they believe this is it. I sat in India on an airplane with a man that, that believed that once you die, you just simply go into the ground, and, and if you lived a good life, hopefully you come back as something better. And as he was sharing with me his belief, I could see even the despair in his own eyes, the hopelessness in his voice. 
As I sat next to him, he said, I've never heard what a Christian from a Christian before. Tell me what you believe. And I told him this, there is something after this life. It's the res- because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There is eternal life. There is heaven. There is no pain. There are no tears. There is no more death. Because Jesus Christ, there in that grave, when he rose again, he defeated death. He defeated hell. He paid our sin debt. And there's power because of the resurrection. You and I don't have to fear death. Death is not final. There's hope because of the resurrection. And lastly today, verse number 19, look with me. Paul says this, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all men most miserable. If there is no resurrection, the future is miserable. He has given us hope. And that hope is steadfast. Listen to me today. I want to speak to the one that's going through life today that you feel there's no hope. I want to speak to the one today that's going through life and you're going through trials and you're going through difficulties and you're going through hurt and you're wondering what is next. It's not a mistake that you've come today to celebrate with us today here at this church that we've opened the word of God and we're going to share truth with you. There are many that may think that the future is miserable. What is your future? Is it fearful? Is it hopeless? Not if you've met Jesus Christ, the risen Savior. Not if you know Jesus Christ. Do you know where you're going today? You see, the future is not miserable if you know Jesus Christ because if you know Jesus Christ and believe that he is risen from the dead, you know where you're spending eternity and it's with the risen Savior. Are you sure Jesus is in your heart? Have your sins been forgiven? Would you bow your heads with me in prayer? If there is no resurrection, death is final. Our future is miserable. Sin is supreme. Our preaching is foolish. Our faith is wasteful. But Paul says this, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Paul is saying there's some that preach the resurrection isn't real, but I'm here to tell you the resurrection is real. There's power because of the resurrection. Maybe there's someone here today that you are living in despair. You are living in hopelessness. You're living in fear. Would you come to Jesus today? Would you let him and the power of the gospel cleanse you from your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness? Would you receive eternal life today? John wrote this in John 3.16 for all For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Will you receive that gift that God has given us through Jesus Christ, his Son? Would you receive that gift, that payment on the cross? The Bible says if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So you say today, how can I receive this gift? The Bible says repent. Believe that Jesus Christ 
paid your sin debt and he rose again see the gospel is not just the cross it's the resurrection as well for it's the resurrection that proved that he is the son of God you say what must I do to be saved just simply cry out to God through a prayer like this God be merciful to me a sinner I know that I've sinned I know that I'm unrighteous and undone but today I receive that free gift of salvation through Jesus Christ I repent of my sin and I turn to Jesus I believe that he died on the cross I believe that he rose again from the grave conquering death and today I ask you to make me your child come into my heart if you sincerely pray and ask God to save you if you sincerely believe the gospel the death the burial the resurrection of Jesus Christ if you sincerely repent and turn to Christ the Bible says that you'll be saved death has no victory sin has no hold preaching is powerful because the resurrection of Jesus Christ is true oh if you're here today and you've never trusted Christ today would you trust him today would you pray would you receive him as your Savior please don't leave here until you have your eternity settled and we can have it settled because of the resurrection no resurrection no everlasting life but because Jesus died and rose again Paul says there's life but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept heaven can be your home father in heaven lord i pray that you'd save 